So that's Micah 7, starting from verse 1. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned, there is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among menhood. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. The hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul, thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchmen, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. That's Micah chapter 7, starting at verse 8. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down, like the mire of the streets. A day for the building of your walls. In that day, the boundary shall be far extended. In that day, they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, and from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. But the earth will be desolate because of his inhabitants, for the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, who dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers 
from the days of old. So where is God? As we look out on the world and, well, we are so distressed, there is suffering all around us. We fear it might be coming our way. So where is God? There's these wars causing untold devastation. We see the egos of these egotistical men and we worry who will constrain them. Where is God? And it's not all out there, far away. There is stuff closer to home, in our lives, around us. Life can be really hard. It feels as if it's all going wrong. But what can be done? We are hurting, and so we ask, where is God? Now through this, we try to muddle on as Christians. We keep going, even with that question playing on our mind. And what sometimes can make it even worse is those around us might choose to add to the pressure. Maybe you know there are those who are pitying your naive trust in this made-up God of yours. And for some, you might not have to guess that. They firmly stick the boot in and tell you. Maybe they will ask with that sneer, where is your God? Maybe even they go on, they'll say, look at the state of your life. Your God's not up to much, is he? if he's even there at all. And don't we feel the force of that? Because we might not let on, but we are asking the very same questions. Where is God? And it turns out this is not a new question at all. The same question was being posed to Micah in his day. We heard it. It's there in the middle of verse 10. Where is the Lord your God? So this is the final installment of our series in Micah, and in these last two chapters, chapters 6 and 7, we hear God addressing his own people and challenging them directly. If you were here last week, we listened to what God requires of those who truly know him. That was chapter 6, verse 8. God has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly? with your God. Aren't those inspiring words? The question is, how did we get on this past week? Doing justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with our God. Well, God tells us how the people in Micah's day were getting on, and this is not how the people were living at all. If you look in the rest of chapter 6, they are wicked They are cheating those around them. They are full of violence and they speak lies. And so God goes on to say, chapter 6, verse 13, Therefore I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. God has had enough. Their behavior shows actually ultimately what they think of him. And so God's going to do something about it. But it does turn out not all of Israel was living like that. There were a few, Micah calls them a remnant, we've had that before, the survivors within Israel. They were trying to stay faithful to the Lord. And Micah, as we come to the conclusion now, is speaking for them on their behalf, expressing their hearts. Look at what he says beginning in chapter 7, verse 1. He simply says, woe is me. And Micah is not exaggerating. The situation really was dire because there was this threat of military defeat from these surrounding empires. And more than that, even within Israel, amongst his own people, life was grim because there was so much wickedness. As he says in verse 2, they, that is his own people around him, all lie in wait for blood. And there's no point going to the authorities because, verse 3, the prince and the judge ask for a bribe. What is life like in a place like that? Well, for a start, it's desperately lonely. And so look what Micah says in verse 5. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. 
how hard it is when those closest to us turn against us. Now, you might recognize those words in verse 6 because Jesus quotes them in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is a chapter all about where Jesus tells us what to expect as his followers. And Jesus is saying it may well be like for us as it was in Micah's day. But why does Jesus then make that connection? Not simply to show the parallels, but rather, Jesus presumably is saying, Micah will help us if that does turn out to be our experience. So that's what we've been doing the last few weeks, and especially today. Micah is to help believers, followers of the Lord Jesus, when times are like this. So if, as Christians, life is feeling hard and lonely, if we have these difficulties, even those close to us, turning against us, how should we respond? And just a word, if at the moment you are not experiencing that, well, give thanks to God, but don't switch off. Jesus himself says, in due course, that may well be your experience too. And above all, Micah would have us look to the Lord. Verse 7 starts with a great Bible, but, but... Verse 7, Micah speaking again for this remnant, the people. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. So yes, military threats filling the screens in Israel. But Micah knows there's more to see than that. Or challenging personal circumstances, threatening to consume the mind. But there is more not to be missed. Put simply, there is the Lord. So contrary to what others are saying, contrary maybe to what we're even feeling, the Lord is there. Now Micah says, wait. He knows it might not be apparent in immediate experience, even far from it. This is certainly not a promise of immediate relief. And yet, the Lord is there. And Micah knows the Lord. He's been telling us about the Lord all through this book. And if you know the Lord, it'll be hard, but you can wait. The situation is ominous, very ominous. But Micah knows there is rescue, salvation to come. So yes, heaven may seem to be silent. But Micah knows here in verse 7, God will hear me. And notice where Micah is saying to look. Where do we tend to look? We're so tempted to just see these challenges around us and obsess with them. Or we focus within and look there on all that's weighing us down. Micah says, don't do that. Even now, don't look only to yourselves or to the world around you. Look to the Lord. And so verse 8. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So the enemy shouldn't really gloat and ask that question, where is the Lord your God? Because to ask that is premature. Notice Micah doesn't say it's going to be sorted out. These current threats may to some extent succeed. Micah says he may fall, but we will rise. And Micah knows life may well be bleak and gloomy, even dark, thickly dark, but... There is light, because the Lord will be our light. So do you see in the midst of this trial and difficulty, there is a confidence in Micah coming through. So what does such confidence look like in practice? Well, we read on, and first, maybe surprisingly, we see that Micah, on behalf of the remnant, recognizes sin. Look how verse 9 begins. Micah says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. I wonder if that's what we expected as Micah spoke to give confidence and hope. And yet, we've heard all of Micah's message over these past few weeks. And I wonder, has it convicted us? Have we been listening carefully Again, to those standards that God requires. Have we realized, actually, in all of this, the problem isn't simply with those out there. Micah has spoken about covetousness, of the ways we always want more. 
He's spoken about doing justice and has exposed the way that our excuses not to do that don't really stand up to much. We'll know that in our hearts we so often fail to love kindness. Which is a striking perspective because all around us, as people struggle and find life difficult, they sound off, don't they? They put the world to rights. They say all that's going wrong. They comment, they observe. It's so awful, isn't it, that? Within the midst of that, the obvious but unstated implication, but I'm not like that. It's them out there. But Micah is speaking as, those, as one who knows the Lord, and we know differently. So, of course, there are things going wrong out there. Sometimes we need to say that openly, even to call on people to repent. But we do that acutely aware that we are part of the problem. We don't think it's them and us. We realize that of ourselves, we are guilty of just the same. So even as we are struggling and wondering why God is letting this happen, we think, we still don't think, but God owes me. We don't think, I deserve better from God, because we know we don't. No wonder, Mike was saying, don't look to yourselves. If you look there, there would be no hope in such a situation. Micah says, look to the Lord. If there is hope, that's where it's to be found, even for sinners like us. So having said that, Micah does go on, and he shows he has this hope for his sin, that the believer's sin is not the end of the story. Look how verse 9 goes on. I'll bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light and I shall look upon his vindication. So Micah the sinner has hope. The true believer has hope. There's a bright future ahead. He or she will see the light and be vindicated. So the remnant does recognize their sin. But then with that, Micah says, remember. The great danger in the Christian life is to forget. We get so caught up with our daily lives, even our difficulties, even the current crisis that we're going through, that we forget. But Micah remembers. He remembers what he knows about God, the sort of things he has told us in his book. We've heard much about them. So Micah now is going to remind us, if you like, we're about to have the greatest hits from Micah, the things he really wants us to remember from the last few weeks. So will you remember the day, verse 11, a day for the building of your walls. In that day, the boundary shall be far extended. In that day, they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt and from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. Do you see what Micah is doing? Do you remember back in chapter four, Micah whetted our appetite for a stunning future. Do you remember the language, the mountain of the house of the Lord would be raised high, established, and all the peoples would flow to it. What kind of place would it be? Well, where swords will be beaten into plowshares, spears into pruning, pruning hooks. And remember, there'd be great abundance of peace and prosperity, security forever. And you see, Micah hasn't forgotten that. He remembers and encourages us to do that the same. That's what he's doing in verses 11 and 12. He's saying, look to the day where that promise of God's place will be a reality where the boundaries of it, if you like, will extend so far that even former enemies like Assyria and Egypt will be swept up and brought in. It's going to be vast from sea to sea, from mountain to mountain, all of it full of the glory of the Lord. And as a believer in the Lord, you will be there. So what does the future hold? Well, we worry. And in the short to medium term, there is uncertainty. There may be difficult experiences. But Micah is saying, look beyond. It won't be that long until the day. Today's struggles, painful as they may be, will not last. On that day, far better is to come. So remember the day. And with that, Micah reminds us, remember the shepherd. If you're with us, right at the beginning of our series, 
Micah set out God's judgment that was heading to all the earth. And there was just one little glimmer of hope, if you remember. There'd be a shepherd, one who would gather his flock, one who was both a king and the Lord. And then if you remember chapter 5, we got more detail, actually very detailed. He would come from a place called Bethlehem, Ephrathah. That place that was too little to be among the clans of Judah. And yet from there would come a ruler who would shepherd the flock in the strength of the Lord. And so that explains verse 14 where we see Micah's prayer. Shepherd your people with the staff, the flock of your inheritance. So Micah hasn't forgotten. And he's looking to God to deliver on that promise. Micah knows what he needs is a shepherd. Someone to take care of him and guide him and lead him. And so he prays for such a shepherd who would provide lush and secure pasture. And so for us, remember, we have a shepherd whose job it is to take care of us and to protect us. So remember the day, remember the shepherd, and then remember the Exodus victory. So in verse 15, in answer to Micah's prayer, the Lord speaks directly. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. Remember, Micah has spoken about that great Exodus rescue already that included marvelous things like those plagues in Egypt, the deliverance through the Red Sea, the provision from heaven. Well, Micah says, remember that. Remember that's how God acts. You will see again marvelous things. And then it is verse 16 begins, the nations. So that first exodus from Egypt was from one nation, Egypt. The problem in Micah's day is not just one nation, but if you like, nations, even empires. But still, the God of the exodus will do marvelous things, even against such a greater enemy. And what will be the outcome? Middle of verse 16, they shall lay their hands on their mouths. You see what Micah is saying? He's bringing to mind those who mocked him. Those who said, where is the Lord your God? Well, such people will be silenced. And not least because their mouths will already be full. Look at verse 17. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. That is, they will be eating mud. So just think, those today who make life hard for Christians, for believers... Like us, who knows how they do it? Do they roll the eyes at you? That little snarky comment, the patronizing put down. Well, Micah says, all who indulge in behavior like that, well, the taunts will be silenced. They will be brought low. One day, if you like, all they'll be able to say, even through gritted teeth, is to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. So Micah is helping us. He is encouraging us. Look to the Lord. Recognize your sin, but remember the day, the shepherd, the Exodus rescue. But again, it's talking in such confidence. So how can we be assured that this isn't just wishful thinking? Will it work out this way? And in particular, we might think, well, okay, if I'm a sinner, that doesn't that mean I'm part of the problem? How do I know on which way it will end up? Well, that brings us to then these closing verses of the book, where Micah now asks another question, which is this, who is a God like you? So do you remember what the enemy had? A question. The enemy taunted by asking, where is the Lord your God? But now ultimately in response, Micah has a question in return. Well, not really directed towards the enemy, but actually towards God himself. Verse 18, who is a God like you. And in fact, this has been the question on the agenda ever since the start of the book, when Micah introduced himself with his name, Micah, because the name means, who is like the Lord? And now he comes all the way around, full circle, and asks the question again. And the point, of course, is God is unique. But someone might well say, well, uniqueness is not enough. God could be uniquely bad or uniquely powerless. What kind of unique is God? Well, Micah says, I'm glad you asked that. 
And in these final verses, you can see Mike is just itching now to bring it all together and tell us how wonderful God is in this uniqueness. Now, there is so much in these final verses, but we'll highlight three traits of our unique God. First, he delights in steadfast love. He delights in steadfast love. Again, let's just put this into the book, the context. Do you remember last week we heard that God's people were to do justice? Why is that? Well, did you notice back in verse 9, Micah knows that God will execute due justice for him. And there's this other parallel. Do you remember last week, we as God's people were to love kindness. That was the challenge from the heart. Well, second half here of verse 18. The Lord does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. Kindness, steadfast love, it's the same word. And this is what God is like in the most amazing way. Notice it doesn't even simply say God is love, although that, of course, is true enough. Have you realized God delights in showing steadfast love? But how can we then be persuaded of that, even when life is such a struggle? Well, this, our God, is the one who casts away sin. So as we've seen, Micah knows our problem, like the world, is that of sin, even as God's people. And Micah, like we know, sin must be punished and dealt with. So we can only look to the future with confidence if we know for sure that that sin of ours will never be held against us. Which brings us, if you like, to the emphasis in these final verses Micah says, if you like, a very similar thing a number of times from different angles. Did you notice? Starts in verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression? Then in verse 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I wonder, can you hear what Micah has in the background as he says those words? It's the song of the sea from Exodus. Do you remember after God had rescued the people from Egypt, there was still a fairly significant problem. Behind them, the chariots were bearing down on them. In front of them, the Red Sea, a dead end. But what did God do? Well, before they knew it, the people were safe on the other side. And the enemy, where were they? Well, in the depths of the sea, never to return. And notice here in verse 19, Micah wants us to think that is what God has done with our sins. Our sins are in the depths of the sea, never to resurface, never to be held against us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has our God, who delights in showing steadfast love, remove our transgressions from us. Of course, we wonder, how has God done this? Well, those in Micah's day would have to keep looking for the shepherd for this new exodus in the future. But for us, these marvelous things are in the past. But they are according to the pattern that Micah has set for us. That good shepherd, well, he heard the cry of his people and he came into this world personally, even to lay down his life for the sheep. And that death, we are told, was a ransom for many. That is paying the redemption, the purchase price, like at the first exodus, but this time from the clutches of sin and death and the devil. And having died, of course, Jesus came out the other side. The beginnings of a new world, a new creation. So this wonderful future that Micah has looked forward to, well, we can see it has started in the resurrected Jesus. And so we can be sure there will be this wonderful place with none of what spoils life now. And in particular, there will be no more sin because that's been left behind in the depths of the sea. So who is a God like you? One who delights in steadfast love, one who casts away sin. And finally, we see this is the God who is faithful to his promises. Last verse. 
you will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Long ago, in the days of old, God had a plan. In a world that was just as much of a mess as Micah's or ours, God spoke, he made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He kept making those promises, including through Micah, as we've heard. And now today we see the fulfillment of so much of what God has said he would do. Assyria and Babylon, ancient history. The shepherd, well, he's come. That ultimate Passover rescue has taken place and we remember it regularly. And now the nations are being gathered in and the kingdom is spreading. And so therefore, even as life is hard, we have every reason to be persuaded that God will finish his work. He's kept so many promises and therefore he will finish the job. These trials will not last. All of God's enemies will be defeated. The kingdom will stretch from sea to sea, from mountain to mountain. And that great plan promised to Abraham so long ago will reach its fruition. And what a glorious day that will be. I'll lead us in a prayer. Father, we do so praise you that even in the darkest days, there is hope. Thank you that you are the God of our salvation, that you have rescued us from sin and cast them into the depths of the sea and so will rescue us from every evil thing. And so we ask for your help that we would keep on looking to you now and always for your glory. Amen. So let's start with this one, Aaron. Um, how does remembering our sin and not just forgiveness encourage us? Well, it'll transform the way we treat God, won't it? So one, it's true. And it would be very easy, and it is easy, to slip into the attitude of them and us, and I deserve better. But ironically, if we think, if we don't realize we are sinners, we'll focus, well, to the extent we focus on ourselves, it'll be that I'm okay, so I can look to myself. And I might even think, I can get my way out of this because I'm competent and able. So a great help, like with Micah, of realizing that I am a sinner, it means it drives my hope somewhere else, which is what immediately happens in that verse. It's very striking that in uh, verse 9, Micah says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. So he knows he can't complain. He may even deserve in some sense some of what is happening as discipline, not as judgment. But then straight away he says, until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me, he will bring me out into the light. I shall look upon his vindication. That is not my own. So he knows that, yes, he's a sinner, and that helps him see the world rightly, but that drives him to look to God for vindication. He's not going to try and do it himself. It drives him to the one who can provide and give for him. So he's not, as we can see from the proportion, obsessed with his sin. He's not wallowing it in an unhelpful way. But presumably, as he has taught these things to us, he has realized, I too am convicted by these things, but it drives him to the Lord, which is a very positive result. You mentioned them and us, and this question says, if in relation to sin, uh, we don't believe in them and us, how do we apply that when we're talking about groups that we disagree with, uh, like St. Helen's response to the House of Bishops, somebody's raised? Fair enough. And you can't say everything every time. So I don't think we look to William, say, speaking on our behalf or others, and say you have to say everything every time. But um, in the round, it means, like Micah and the other prophets, there is a right time for speaking out against sin, for calling for repentance, and sometimes that's from particular groups. We see that all through the scriptures. So that's a prophetic ministry, a right thing to do. But in the round, like with Micah, you've just realized, but he obviously considers himself as included in those who deserve judgment from the Lord. That is only, you can tell from the excitement at the end, 
Who is a God like you? And the thing he focuses on is God's love, the way he pardons iniquity. And he can only be excited like that because he knows he's a beneficiary of it. So the key is to remember all these things in the round, that over time we know that sometimes we find it difficult to speak out, but we must because it's God's standards and it's for people's good that others are called to repent, both for their sake and for others. But we will do it from a heart that knows there, but for the grace of God go I. I want others to know the rescue that I enjoy and ultimately that is why I'm doing it. I'm calling on people, not because I think I'm better, because I think, why don't you also look to the Lord and receive his rescue that I am so thrilled to receive? Uh, Micah obviously has lots of hope in chapter seven. Uh, Can we hope like him if our circumstances are the result of our own sin? Well, yeah, wonderfully we can, and all the more. So um, in one sense, well, the the, the circumstances of Israel were due to sin. So there were nations oppressing from the outside. But Micah has helped us to see that, you know, God is in control. He is sovereign. And in particular, Micah knew that that judgment was because of the nation's sin. And so it was deserved. And so... In one sense, what we experience negatively, the bad time, we know that we, in a sense, do deserve it. In fact, we never get treated as badly as we deserve. And so, therefore, these truths do apply to us. It's absolutely wonderful that even if we've brought it on ourselves, ultimately, these hopes are still ours. So it's for the sin that I've done. And even if that sin directly caused some sort of suffering, well, God, in his kindness, will rescue me from it and bring me to a much better place that's the kind of shepherd that Jesus is one more question about sin Uh, do Christians need to think of ourselves as part of the problem aren't we blameless in Jesus now so it's a wonderful truth that before the Lord we are blameless our sin has been washed away our sins are at the bottom of the sea but Micah knew that because he delighted in it. And yet it wasn't wrong for him to recognize his sin. In the New Testament, Jesus' disciple John knew full well that forgiveness was once and for all. He was at the cross when Jesus says, it is finished, done with, forever at the cross. And yet John in his letter can say, if we say that we are about this sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us. So he realized even though our sin is once and for all dealt with, as we in practice continue to sin, it is right that we recognize that, that we confess it and seek to change the way that we live in the light of it. Speaking of God's character, can you clarify the difference between God showing steadfast love and him being a promise keeper? Well... (laughs) There's a difference of emphasis, but it's all part of God's wonderful character. I hope those of us studying Exodus have realized that um, Exodus is, well, all over Micah, like it is over the whole Bible, but especially this chapter. I mentioned the Song of the Sea. It's there, actually, there's lots of allusions to it. Micah is trying to say, remember the Exodus rescue. This is like that. And in particular, of course, in Exodus, God, uh, Moses asks to see God's glory and to see his character. Well, why don't we actually look at it just to see it? So ex- keep a finger in Micah if you're there. Turn to Exodus 34. And this will show us that uh, Micah wasn't being original when he told us what he saw about God's character. So Exodus 34, this is where Moses asks to see the glory of the Lord and the Lord tells him to wait behind a rock and the Lord will pass by and Moses will, so to speak, see his back. But Moses does see the glory of the Lord, which is his character. Verse, chapter 34, verse 6, page 88. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. So, Micah is clearly picking up what he knows about God's character from history, applying them to his own situation, which is what we do. And so steadfast love and faithfulness very much go together. But that word faithfulness, you know, the focus of it is truth and God speaking and consistency of character and doing what he says. 
steadfast love, the word as we look and see how it gets used, it is a word all about kindness and compassion and grace, particularly to the undeserving. But really, you can't understand either until you see how the two come together, that even to the undeserving like us, God has made promises and his love is seen in the way he will keep those promises despite the ways that we've treated him. So we can tease them apart while always having to drive them together and seeing them as one.